To start, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Mimi Turner from the Lad Bible. And she is the marketing director there. She's going to talk about the power of audience, driving audience through mobile and social. Mimi. It's fabulous that you came at 9.15 on a Wednesday morning, um, especially those of you who had a good night on the 24th floor yesterday. My name's Mimi Turner. I'm the marketing director of the Land Bible. And I'd like to talk a little bit today about audiences, because audiences are a prerequisite for all of us in this room. And I'd like to talk about audiences from the perspective of a business that has built a very large audience in a relatively short time. So the Lad Bible has, is, is followed on social, just on Facebook actually, by 50% of the entire UK 18 to 24 year, year old male population. And you know, I've been in media for a while, both as a journalist and then in a big, quite traditional media company. And, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't think that there has been a brand which has built an audience of half a very difficult-to-reach demographic. So what I want to do is I want to talk about um, what we're seeing from that perspective, and uh, I'm going to show you what it feels to be us disrupting traditional media. Um, I really like this slide. This is, this, I, you know, this, there's a caption for this slide virtually every day of the year. This is also, in case uh, you've ever wondered, it's what it's like to be um, the only woman in an all-male boardroom. That's probably a conversation <laughs> for another time, but um, if you wondered what it felt like, this is what it feels like. I want to take you through some numbers about our business, but um, just to kind of canter through who we are. Um, the business is four years old. As I said, it's actually three and a half years old. Uh, we have 26 million followers on social media. Um, my CEO is 24 now. Um, we have half the male population and nearly 20% of the female population in the 18 to 24-year-old demographic. And we've got some pretty big numbers. We drive some extraordinarily large amounts of reach. And video is increasingly a large part of our proposition. Um, we worked it out that... Um, we actually play less video out on, on Facebook than we used to, but uh, we are delivering a thousand years of viewing across our brands on Facebook every month. A thousand years, a millennia of viewing, and that is all an aggregate of short form, and that's a really interesting area for us. So monthly video viewing time is a thousand years. One of the things that people ask me is, how did the Lad Bible get so big? And there are, you know, that's an essay question. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of depth to the answer to that question. But one of the things that really helped us is that, it's my, in my view, you know, three years ago, there was something like a year zero. There was, you know, the clock stopped and started again. And content became something that you could access easily through mobile. So the ubiquity of mobile smartphones drove social channels and costs of accessing that kind of content became very manageable because you had a manageable data package and you knew what it was costing or you could connect to Wi-Fi. And these three things together came, became a kind of crucible for a business like ours because what it meant is it showed that for the first time, what human beings really like to do is we like to talk to people who we have things in common with. And this was a real shift, and it was a real change from what I would like to call traditional media, which is really, in a market of limited supply, some authorities will come and tell you what they think you ought to know. And it turns out that while that was all there was, that was what human beings did, but now that there is a bigger, uh, uh, there is much more availability of choice, 
we spend our time talking to people that we have things in common with. And I think that we're going to see that far more as we go forward. So one of the things we are seeing is an absolute generational shift in what, uh, um, in what users consume. And, you know, and that's, that's what makes me think that the future is not going to resemble the past. We can't always look at the past for lessons about the future. Um, this is a chart uh, which tells you two things. Um, the UK media regulator Ofcom has, uh, every, every year, gives out a um, report on the communications industry. And this year, they put the report out on Twitter. I happen to follow the broadcasting minister, so that's how I picked it up. The discovery was entirely in social. And what Ofcom said is that children aged 12 to 15 have fundamentally different communications habits even than 18 to 24-year-olds. So we're seeing in under 24s two cycles of consumers who use their time to do different things. Now, the chart at the bottom is actually not from Ofcom. It's from um, an analyst called Benedict Evans at Anderson Horowitz, who I'm sure everybody in the room knows about. So they, they sift through vast amounts of information and data, and they come up with some really clever things. And one of the things they did is they asked children, 11 to 15 year olds, if you had to give up some of your technology, what would you miss the most? Now, I know you can't, probably can't see it, but they asked about game consoles, PCs, TV sets, and other things. And of the things that girls and boys missed, it would have been their mobile. Now, for me, that's, that's relatively interesting. But the most interesting thing is that 11 to 15 year olds have all this stuff. They have all this stuff. They have the choice of consoles and TVs and mobile. And, you know, when I was 11, I had sellotape. I had sellotape and a stick. And that's how you made your entertainment. That, that was what you did. And if you had a bike, you were lucky. And you might have played Monopoly. And that's what we did when we were 11 and 15. Um, and the other thing about when I was 11 is that I did virtually exactly the same things that my parents did. They watched television. They listened to records. They listened to the radio. They read newspapers and magazines. And I did all of those things. I might have done them in a different, um, I might have listened to different music, I might have read different magazines, and I might have listened to different radio. But fundamentally, it was completely recognizable. And now I have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old. I have absolutely no recognition of what they actually do. I have to sit them down and say, why is it you want to watch 72 hours straight of Stampy and Squid, and then go on to Tumblr to find out more about it. You know, those, these habits are not something that the traditional media producers are even going to be able to understand. And this generation is absolutely able to curate its own experience. And the thing about a generational uh, shift is that you're either on one side or you're on the other side. I just want a quick show of hands. Does everybody know why this side is funny? Yes, excellent. So did I. I'm just going to say, I know why that side is funny, and I don't text like that. But anyway, um, I wanted to talk about three words that I hear a lot. And you hear them a lot, especially in industries which I think are struggling to grasp the extraordinary shifts that we're living through. And those three words are, people will always. People will always, you hear it in um, television, people will always watch television. So an interesting thing that's happened in television is that young people don't actually watch very much television. And this is a real trauma for television executives because they want to believe that their model and their monetization model, which produces an hour-long show, is going to be impervious to change. So even though they have teenage children who don't watch television, they're quite often keen to say, you know, people will always watch television. And I think you also hear this in... Uh, print. People will always read newspapers. People will always read magazines. Well, you know, I think there's a bit of a debate about that, because I think that the economics of distribution of a product that has to be in a shop by 7 o'clock in the morning and is stale by 2.30 in the afternoon means that if you're in print, you're in the baguette business. You make baguettes and you distribute baguettes. You're in the trucks and highways business. You're not actually in the content business. Um, what I want to tell you about this picture is that this is a horse uh, and cart driven ice cart. In England, in the 1820s, if you wanted ice delivered to your house, the ice cart would come to you 
um, twice a day in the winter and maybe four times a day in the summer, and they would deliver blocks of ice to your house. So if you're a private house or if you were a um, fishmonger, this is how it came. And the ice industry is really interesting because, first of all, it started in the early 1800s and frozen canal ice would come to London, but then it turned out that frozen canal ice was really polluted and it had dead dogs and human excrements uh, and it was really unpleasantly uh, not the kind of thing you wanted to use to make ice cream. So people imported ice from Norway. Norway, clean lake ice became something that came to the UK. Uh, and by the mid-1850s, Norway was exporting a million tons of ice. And Norway had gone from clean ice in lakes to artificial lakes to a really complex distribution system by which the ice came from Norway, came to Rotherhithe, came up uh, the canal system to London and was stored in an ice pit. Ice pits 60 feet across, 100 feet deep is where these guys would go in, bring up the ice and distribute it. It was a very complex global supply chain and people invested a lot of money in, um, uh, in all the infrastructure to supply it. And you know, the reason they did is because I think they made the bet. I think they made a bet that people will always need ice. People always need ice. You've got to be you've got to be incredibly sympathetic to that model because it turned out that actually people didn't always need ice. People needed to keep things cold. And by 1920, American households had refrigeration and the ice business was, was decimated, never to come again. And what I think is interesting about this is that disruption is not something that comes along when something amazing replaces something that was, you know, crappy all the time. Disruption happens when something simple comes along and it displaces a very complex, very elegant, very powerful, very human, very thought through business model. And I think all of us here in this industry are creating and recreating, constantly shifting complex ecosystems. And I think we have to just be quite, um, quite careful that we know whether we're in the ice business or we're, whether we're in the keeping things cold business, because those two businesses started off the same and then they moved away from each other, just in the way that the newspaper business supplied the need for news. Initially, those two were absolutely locked together. And then, over time, the, they have become further and further apart. And a lot of stuff now sits in the middle of news and newspapers. So where does all this take us? It's, uh, I've been, this is the first time I've been to DigiDay, and it's been really interesting for me to hear three days of people talking about different elements of a quite complex ecosystem. And it, one of the things I feel really powerfully is that we need to know what need our business is actually trying to serve. And a need is not the same as... Uh, it, it, the answer to what need is generally a thing that human beings like to do. So a need isn't, you know, the answer to what need does your business serve is not ad tech or people will always need ads. It might be people will always not want to monetize content. But in publishing particularly, I do think that only publishers who really listen to what their audience say to them and to what their audience want and to, what, and to deliver the audience the content in the way that that audience wants to receive it I think they're the only people who are going to really capitalize on an environment where the economics of distribution are just more favorable than they ever have been. You know, people talk a lot about platforms and whether the terms of working with Facebook or Apple or Google or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat are favorable to publishers. But you know something? In the morning, I don't have to get up and put and sit in everybody's broadband server and just drop down, the, press a button to get our content to them. Distribution is in the favor of publishers in the way that I don't think it's ever been before. We're not in the baguette business. We don't have to undertake all the costs and all the margin uh, accrual of, um, of distribution. Distribution is a, uh, uh, an opportunity that we can take to reach multiple audiences. So, just to kind of finish up, 
you know, it does occur to me that everybody in this room is making a bet. We are all like those guys with the ice cart. We're making a bet on what we think the future is going to be like. And for, um, for our business, I think the bet that we are making is that young people will always want content that's relevant to them and delivered in the ways that they want to consume it. You know, that's our bet. We're putting that bet on the table. And you know something? We're like a really young business. Four years is not a heritage industry. Four years is, is just an idea of how much we have to learn. We've got a lot to learn. You know, we've got to learn how to get a company from 30 people to 60 people to 100 people. That's a lot of learning. We're going to have to we're going to have to do quite a lot of things that other people in this room have done already. But my view is, I think we're going to take the time to actually learn that. And I would, um, I would say that of all the times to be alive, this is one of the most exciting times to roll the dice on that bet. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Mimi. I um, want to open up to questions, but I have one for you to start. Yes. You, you showed some tremendous growth uh, figures up there. <laughs> Facebook's got to be a huge part of that, right? Yes. So how much do you feel like that is a risk? I mean, there's obviously upsides to it. You probably couldn't have grown as fast without Facebook growing so quickly over the last four years, too. Um, but at the same time, aren't, don't you, to some degree, feel like you're a slave to an algorithm that you don't control? Okay, I'm just going to answer that question with my, question, <laughs> with, with my thing about baguettes. Okay, so distribution with all different platforms, we are in control of understanding the content that works for that audience. So, you know, I don't feel enslaved to anything. And also, you know, I, just, I came from a print background. Yeah. I worked in a media organization. There you are the slaves to retailers. You're the slaves to their margin. You're also the slaves to uh, logistics operators. That's, that, that is a complex situation compared to that. Everybody who's in publishing and digital today should be skipping and laughing mm -hmm. and happy. So it's just a new set of challenges, I mean, with supply It's chain. an easier okay. set of challenges. Easier, interesting. And easier and far more, you know, far more, there's far more opportunity. You know, one of the things that people don't say about Facebook, but which I think is, is incredibly uh, relevant, and I think we should, we should recognize it, is that if you were in any other supply side business, you had, it was your job, and you had to pay a cost for every single person who got your product. Algorithms, if your content works for that audience, they will lift you to people you didn't even know that you could re reach. That's how we reach 120 million people a mm -hmm. week. That's like twice the population of the UK. It's because our content system is resonating with human beings. And these are platforms who are delivering relentlessly, massively, ever more uh, authentic experiences to the people that they need to keep on their platforms, which are their users. So I'm just, I'm incredibly optimistic. And also, I've lived through an environment where that was not, that was not the case. Right. We have a generous system that we didn't exist before. OK. Want to open up to questions? A couple of microphones. Paul has one over here. I'm quite nervous of Paul's questions. Get ready for the hard one. Mine was the easy one. <laughs> right here. Right here. Hi, great talk. Oh. Um, so I'm going to ask a difficult, difficult question, sorry. I um, might not know the answer. I'm just putting that out there. Okay. <laughs> so uh, copyright. Obviously, a lot of uh, user-generated content yes. is of either unknown or questionable copyright. Um, as a, a unknown or questionable copyright. Uh, we're really s oh, okay. So, so um, when you're kind of small and growing, you can kind of find the radar. Yeah. When you get big, obviously, people might. Do, do you, have you had to change the way that you handle copyrighted images? Yeah, I think absolutely. So we now have a. Uh, I, I think the environment has changed. So maybe three years ago, social sharing of content was a thing that publishers could pick up, and actually, there isn't a publisher even now who doesn't pick up that. We took a view that actually we'd quite like to build a creative community 
in this kind of short form environment. So we care very much about working with talent. We'd like to grow our own stars. And for that, creative people have to be rewarded. They have to be partnered. They have to be credited. They have to be licensed. Not because we have to have to have to do that, but because I think it makes us the best. I think it makes us really better. So yes, it has evolved. And yes, for us, you know, crediting, acquiring, licensing, uh, sponsoring, and working with creative talent, I think it's a huge opportunity for us. And you know, we'd be silly if we just blew it and just ripped people's content. We actually credit content all the time, and um, you know, we have a constant dialogue, because a lot of our content comes from our community. We get about 1,500 content submissions a day, because people love the Live Bible, and they want to be on it. We want those people to be happy with the experience. We don't want those people to feel they were unhappy with the experience. So we've actually taken a very structural view about how we handle that, and we want to constantly optimize. Yeah. Mimi, can you speak a little about your efforts uh, reaching consumers on Snapchat and how it compares to the operation you built over Facebook? Um, well, okay. yeah, I can a little bit. Um, so we actually have a whole ecology of platforms. So we have our site, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we, uh, we're learning storytelling in Instagram. So we just got over about 1.1 million followers. And that, that's doubled in the last three months on Instagram. Snapchat's also a completely different uh, curation experience. And we've really, uh, you know, that's been interesting. So we get about, I think James can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we get about 100,000 likes per snap that we put out. And we, you know, that's also been a relatively recent uh, um, thing for us. So yes, you know, our job is not to try and do what I think would be a mistake, which is to take the same content and try to window it in different areas. I just don't think that works. Actually, you want to get storytellers who know about Twitter to tell your stories on Twitter. You want to get storytellers who are Instagram addicts and get them to tell your stories. And, and the thing that, the arc that runs through that is tone. So our tone, which we think is uplifting, positive, funny, and excited about you know, being human and being alive. I think that is the thing that runs through all these different kinds of stories. And actually, I just say that content will always change. Six months ago, our content, maybe the mix of content, certainly the ratio, you know, the video to, to image content was always different. And that will always change. I'm, I'm very relaxed about that. If it stopped changing, I'd be worried. But actually, the thing that doesn't change is the kind of response that people have to that content. And that, for us, is the thing that we measure the most. Okay. Mimi, thank you so much. Fantastic. Appreciate thank you very it. much. Okay.